virgin most powerful radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Oh, yes. It is time to enter into the Apologetic Zone. Yes, it is Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetic Dojo. I am your host and sensei, Gary Machuda. And uh, it's great to be with you again. Talk about uh, the things that uh, uh, it's most important in our life, namely our faith and sharing and defending and explaining the faith with confidence and clarity and charity. And we have a great show in store for you today. Uh, we're going to have a guest sensei, special guest, Dr. Douglas Beaumont comes back to the dojo. Um, you might be familiar with Dr. Beaumont. He wrote an incredible book called Evangelical Exodus. And uh, we're going to talk about one of the two uh, pillars of the Protestant Reformation and how he dealt with it. And what is that pillar? Well, it's the Bible alone. All right. So the Bible alone. Sola Scriptura is on the docket today. Is the Bible alone uh, a kind of do-it-yourself kit where we can reconstruct Christianity from its pages? Was that what its intent was? And uh, why should anybody oppose something like following the Bible alone? Well, Dr. Beaumont's going to help us navigate those waters, uh, which, by the way, he's a convert. So it's, uh, it's interesting to hear how he came to grips with uh, understanding this doctrine and also why he ultimately found it inadequate. Also, we're going to do uh, our usual exercises and just for something completely different. The finding of the fallacy for today is the non sequitur, <laughs> which is a fun fallacy. You know, it's funny how many find, uh, fallacies are used in comedy, uh, like equivocation, using the same word in different meanings. And, and non sequitur is kind of one of those staple fallacies of c comedies. I mean, whole TV programs have been made of non sequiturs. Uh, so we're going to talk about the non sequitur. That, that'll be a lot of fun. We're also going to meet the early church father for today, who is Gregory of Nisa, St. Gregory of Nisa. Early church father, very interesting father, um, and he's going to be the, the third of the three great Cappadocian fathers that we talk about. And as always, Hands On Apologetics is uh, open up for discussion for you. So perhaps you'll have a question for Dr. Beaumont. Give us a call at 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Or you can always email your questions at handsonapologetics.com. And uh, we uh, appreciate it. I look at every email I get, and uh, I try to respond to everyone. And sometimes we actually bring it to the program. So please, let's fill up the dojo mailbox, and uh, maybe we could set aside a whole program. We could just go through all the mail. Also, uh, coming up, man, I cannot believe how quickly this is coming up. On February 20th, everybody down there in Southern California, mark that date down, because that is when the Midwest Command Center shuts down, and yours truly flies out to sunny, sunny California. Sunny, like, boy, I, I just love the thought of sunny weather, sunny Southern California. And uh, we're going to visit the historic uh, Sacred Heart Chapel and do a talk on breaking the Bible barrier, why Catholic appeals to the Bible fail and how to make them successful. It'll be free. It's going to be at 7 p.m. at the chapel. I'm going to have my books and CDs available. It's going to be lots of fun. And it's also going to be fun because for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week, I am going to be down at the world headquarters of Virgin Most Powerful Radio, uh, broadcasting hands-on apologetics there. So that's going to be that's going to be fun because I hope to uh, I hope to be able to uh, do a couple of surprise interviews. And uh, for those who are familiar with Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Uh, they'll be familiar names. I'm going to be interviewing one program. We're going to talk to 
Terry Barber about his book on evangelism. That's going to be fun. Also, uh, a guy that I highly respect, Matthew Arnold. It's going to be another one and uh, a possible third interview, which uh, hey, I'll kind of keep it secret. Uh, it, it's going to be all of it's going to be fun. And it's all going to be great to be in the brand new studios down there. And talk about brand new studios, you know, thank you so much for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. We appreciate it, especially with your prayers. Uh, we need your prayers always. Uh, also, for sharing us on social media. You know, pass the word around about programs. Maybe there is a program, Hands on Apologetics or Jesus 911 or many of the other great programs that you enjoy. Share it, you know, share it, spread the link around. Uh, Bring people to come to know it. And also, we appreciate your financial contributions. I know they have uh, one studio up and running, and they're working on a second one. So, uh, of course, you know, financial contributions go a long way, and we really appreciate it. Um, also, it's time. I almost forgot to give the shout-outs to those watching live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everybody. Ah, nice to see everybody. Ah, I get, even have a dojo uh, themed uh, emojis. Nice, Ricky. Love it. All right. Uh, so we have a great show in store for you today. Can't wait to dive into it. So why don't we begin with uh, going through some of our exercises. For example, the Finding the Fallacy exercise, which today is the non sequitur. Uh, this is a very easy fallacy to remember. It basically means, in Latin, doesn't follow. Okay, so it, it's an argument where the conclusion or statement doesn't necessarily or logically follow from all the previous arguments and statements. And in other words, there's like a big disconnect between the argument and the conclusion. And like I said, this is used a lot in comedy, but it also occurs a lot in apologetics, both on the web, person to person, even in debates, there's uh, non sequiturs being thrown around. So let me give you a couple examples. For example, someone may argue some Catholics are immoral, therefore the Catholic Church is false. Well, that's a classic non sequitur right there. Why? Because, well, does it necessarily follow logically that because some Catholics are immoral, that the teaching of the Catholic Church must be false, right? There's no necessary connection there. So that's what we call a non sequitur. Also, uh, you, another one is that, uh, well, if you were born in an Islamic country, you'd be Muslim. Therefore, Christianity isn't true. It's just a social construct. Well, that, again, doesn't necessarily follow, just because uh, someone can make a hypothetical case about what your religion would be in a certain location. It really doesn't speak to whether or not Christianity is true, right? So it's a non sequitur. A does not, or B does not follow from A, let's put it that way. Or another non sequitur. There are many difficult passage in the passages in the Bible. Therefore, the Bible can't be inerrant. Well, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily follow either, because uh, you could have difficult passages to understand, but that doesn't mean that those difficult passages are uh, erring, right? That that could just be that maybe they're not clear. Maybe we're not understanding it correctly. Maybe there is some sort of fault in our uh, translation or even from manuscripts uh, that our manuscripts are faulty or something like that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the original inspired manuscript uh, contains errors. So that's our finding of the fallacy for today. It's the non sequitur, folks. And, uh, you know, if you listen to this program long enough, you'll notice that, yes, Sensei Gary often does many non sequiturs. <laughs> Trust me, I'm trying to cut down, trying to cut down. Yeah, it's just like trying to cut carbs out of your diet. Try to try not to do too many non sequiturs, which actually that analogy probably is a non sequitur in and of itself. Okay, now that I've confused everyone listening to the program, let's move on to our next episode or next exercise, I should say. Although uh, listening to this, you probably want to listen to the next episode. Meet the early church father, St. Gregory of Nyssa. St. Gregory of Nyssa was born roughly around 335, died around 394. And St. Gregory of Nyssa is the younger brother of Basil the Great. He was born, like I said, around the year 335. And he's the third of the three great Cappadocian fathers. Now, I can relate. You know, that must be tough being the younger brother of a guy who comes to be known as Basil the Great. Uh, you know, that, talk about pressure to live up. And actually, you know, when we read this bio, you'll see that uh, that comes kind of true for Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, unlike Basil, 
Uh, he was not a good administrator or leader. And unlike his other brother, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, he was not particularly a, a great preacher either. So he wasn't a good administrator. He wasn't a great preacher, but he was incredibly gifted as a mystic and a theologian. So uh, his writings may not be as eloquent as Gregory of Nazianzus, or he might not have been as great of an administrator as Basil the Great, but uh, he does have some pretty deep writings. Uh, he was educated, for the most part, by his older brother, Basil, and uh, he advanced in the church as far as a, a lector, um, although he, he was more concerned with worldly career as a teacher of rhetoric. And uh, he was convinced by Gregory of Nazianzus to, uh, to perhaps even enter a monastery. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, like that Gregory, was eventually consecrated, uh, kind of against his preferences. Now, he, he didn't, wasn't forced to be consecrated, but uh, he, the, it was definitely uh, you know, submitting to the will of God in that matter. And uh, so Gregory of Nyssa uh, agreed to take position of uh, C in Nisa, and uh, and unfortunately, he really didn't live up to the expectations of Basil the Great. His older brother, Basil, often criticized him and uh, blamed him continuously for his lack of firmness, uh, his unfitness for a political slash ecclesiastical position, and also as for his poor uh, fiscal administration. Um, he may have been married. Scholars aren't really sure. Um, he did write a, a treatise on virginity, which suggests that he wasn't. Uh, he became Bishop of Nyssa in 371 or 372. And eventually he makes it to the First Council of Constantinople in 381. And uh, eventually that's kind of the last we hear about him, around 394. So that's our early church father for today, Gregory of Nyssa. Coming up next, we will talk to Dr. Douglas Beaumont about Sola Scriptura. Stay tuned, everybody. If you're a listener to Virgin Most Powerful Radio, you already know about Hands-On Apologetics with Master Apologist Gary Machuda. And if you're a fan of Hands-On Apologetics, then we have some exciting news for you. This February, Sensei Gary will be leaving the Apologetics Dojo in Michigan to visit the Virgin Most Powerful Radio World Headquarters in Covina, California. And if you'll be in Southern California this February, we have more exciting news for you. Not only will Gary be doing his live show from our Virgin Most Powerful Radio studio, but he will be giving a live presentation on February 20th at 7 p.m. right here at the Sacred Heart Chapel. That's Gary Machuda speaking live on the topic of Breaking the Bible Barrier, Why Catholic Appeals to the Bible Fail, and How to Make Them Successful. For more information, call 877-526-2151 or visit virginmostpowerfulradio.org. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%! Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 
1-800-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. It's great to see you. Uh, well, I can't see you, but it's great that you're here. I see you in the chat rooms, and uh, things are moving along. So uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm sorry. I had to get my uh, papers together here. Yes, it is time for us to call forth our guest. And our guest today is Dr. Douglas Beaumont. Dr. Beaumont received his PhD in theology from Northwest University and MA in apologetics from Southern Evangelical Seminary. He's a convert to the faith and he's the author of an awesome book. By the way, if you don't have it, I highly recommend it. It's called Evangelical Exodus, Evangelical Seminarians and Their Path to Rome. He's also authored several other books. And I hope I could talk to him a little bit about those as well. He's a popular speaker. He's a catechist. He's also a DRE, as his bio says. You can uh, access uh, his information, his writings, and all sorts of other good stuff at his website, www.douglasbeaumont.com. And Dr. Beaumont, welcome to Hands-On Apologetics. Hey, Gary. Great to be back. Yeah, it is. I really enjoyed our last conversation, so I'm glad you took me up on the offer. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> hey, before we begin, you know, uh, could you maybe give us uh, maybe a five or ten minute uh, thumbnail sketch of your background? Um, because uh, I, I mentioned the evangelical exodus, but um, some people who may not be familiar with your background, uh, I think they really enjoy hearing the story. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I became a Christian as an adult. I was I was just about in college uh, when I first became a Christian. So a, a big chunk of my first part of my life was yeah, essentially as a non-believer. I, I wouldn't call myself an atheist, but I definitely wasn't living any kind of, of Christian life. Um, and uh, as I as I grew in the faith and began reading, I got really interested in apologetics and defending the faith because I'd kind of been on the other side uh, for quite some time. And um, I eventually... Uh, in my late 20s, moved out to North Carolina to go to seminary because I had discovered a school out there that actually majored in apologetics, uh, which was extremely unusual at the time. There's there's a few others that do it now. But uh, I became kind of a disciple of Norman Geisler, um, who was a, a pretty famous Christian apologist at the time, and I was just really interested in defending the faith. Ended up um, doing some work with him on his systematic theology, and eventually uh, graduated, started working on my Ph.D. there and actually teaching. So I spent uh, 10 years as a professor there, uh, teaching for graduate and undergraduate classes and working on my Ph.D. And, uh, you know, I, I'd gotten a book published. I was speaking coast to coast. A lot of great stuff was happening and uh, lo and behold, another giant change was <laughs> on its way. Um, there, there were several issues that even after finishing a degree at the school and teaching for all that time that I really felt like I had not hit um, bedrock yet. Um, mm -hmm. so, some issues that, that really required a lot more looking into than I had had time for. And so I, I used some of that time that I was working on my Ph.D. Uh, to do a lot more in-depth work on some of those questions that I had, and a lot of them had to do with um, the canon of Scripture, you know, wh where exactly did all of these books come from. Um, you know, I, I had learned as an apologist to defend the Bible in general as the Word of God, but the more and more I appreciated the fact that the Bible was essentially a, a, a single bound library, I realized that that wasn't really good enough, that each one of these books had a past and had a reason for being there, and those weren't things I'd looked into uh, incredibly deeply yet. Hmm. And then another big issue for me was the idea of orthodoxy. Um, you know, we, our, our tagline at the school was that we are set here to defend the historic Christian faith, um, and yet we were kind of an oddball school <laughs> that had um, a rather eclectic collection of, of different positions. It was, it was kind of a mix of um, old-school Baptist theology with um, dispensational Dallas Theological Seminary um, type stuff, which was the background of most of the professors, so that wasn't a big shock. Um, but the, the most interesting ingredient at the uh, school was a heavy reliance on Thomas Aquinas, at least his philosophy. 
uh, for our apologetic system. And, and that was something that really set us apart. It, was, it made us very unique. But it was a rather odd mix. And, uh, you know, so it, it wasn't unusual to see somebody walking around with a copy of the, the Summa in one hand and, um, you know, Charles Ryrie in the other. <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, that's probably the only building on the planet where, you know, something like that would not be considered odd. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it occurred to me time and again, you know, how, how is it that this little school, you know, that isn't connected to any denomination or any university or even any church, um, has found the particular uh, list of ingredients that, when mixed together, give you the historic Christian faith. You know, because I knew enough of the history to realize, you know, some of this stuff we teach doesn't go back very far. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the more I, I kind of branched out and explored ideas from other denominations and other branches of Christianity, I realized that, wow, we are really actually, like, in a serious minority here. And... Um, if I'm going to be an apologist and defend the historic Christian faith, I, I need to have a better handle on what that is. And uh, that, that drove me deeper and deeper into history and you know, just logic and thinking through these things. And um, after about a five-year struggle, um, I finally came to the conclusion that you know, Jesus really did start a church and that it has to be identified historically and not uh, doctrinally, um, which is kind of the Protestant method. And, uh, yeah, so that eventually led me to consider Eastern Orthodoxy and um, Catholicism, which I never in a million years would have thought I'd be doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it, it eventually convinced me that I, I wasn't going to be able to stay evangelical. Um, I didn't know where I was going to end up, but I knew it wasn't going to be there. So I had to, uh, you know, I, I walked away from my position. I, I quit working on a Ph.D. that I'd been working on for three years um, and, you know, lost a lot of, my network, um, and just kind of secluded myself in a, in a secular job and an Anglican church where I could hide out and, and, uh, explore <laughs> for a few years. And, uh, yeah, after five years of, of pretty intense study and soul searching and everything else, I, I entered the church, uh, in 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What an amazing story. And, uh, I, I, in some ways, I really sympathize with you because if I were to choose, you know, if I was in your shoes, I would probably choose uh, the same school you did because I, I love apologetics and it's hardcore. It's great. And then, then uh, man, what a journey. Now, you mentioned something really interesting, which actually fits perfect segues into our segment is uh, that you said from an evangelical perspective, uh, the historic church is identified through uh theology through uh doctrines and so uh, it's kind of that sets up where you can see the importance of the bible right because the bible therefore determines what is and what is not the church right yeah as as i started asking these kinds of questions the the response that i would typically get um and I'm, I'm barely even paraphrasing here. This this is nearly word for word. Heard it more than once. Um, was essentially that we we can make the claim that we are teaching historic Christianity because we're teaching what the apostles taught. Yeah. And you know the formula basically is well what the apostles taught is in scripture, and we are the ones interpreting scripture correctly. Therefore, we are teaching what the apostles taught, and we can make the claim to be the historic Christian faith, even though you know, several features, <laughs> some of the most important ones of our theology, uh, you know, didn't arise until the 16th century, uh, even the 19th century, uh, in SES's case. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a, it, it seems like there's a little bit of kind of uh, verbal trickery going on there. Yeah, uh, yeah, so when history's kind of condensed down to New Testament, and it kind of ends there, and then you jump to the Scripture. Exactly. Yeah, you you have a Bible in the first century, and everything since then has just been different people doing their best to understand it. And, you know, once you've done your best, you get together with a bunch of other people that have done their best and agree on the conclusions, and then that's the church. Yeah. So, uh, so is it fair to say, then, if you're going by the Bible alone, that uh, the Christian faith is more probabilistic? You know, that uh, this is most probably what Jesus and the apostles taught as opposed to some other interpretation? Yeah, I don't really see any way around that conclusion. Um, yeah. Because, 
you know, the, it's it's not as though Protestants are unaware of the fact that there's a lot of disagreement uh, within the movement. Um, I mean, there's there are a couple of the, the biggest evangelical publishers have an entire series uh, that that pit all of these different views against each other. Um, yeah. You know, th- th- this is not this is not surprising, but it just it's taken to be just the way it is. That this is just how it is. So all you can do is do your best. Um, <clears throat> you know, and that yeah. either entails, uh, you know, going to some sort of seminary or graduate school level uh, training in order to learn the languages and learn proper biblical interpretation and history and philosophy and all the other things you would need to know to, to be sure of your interpretation. Uh, or it means finding someone that can act as an authority for you in that role. But of course, the difficulty is, if you're not an authority, how do you pick an authority? And typically what happens is uh, you, you get a good idea of what you already think, and then you find an authority that agrees with you, and off you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I know lots of people who have done that, who have church shopped. And, uh, you know, their criteria was, well, does it fit my expectations of what the church ought to be teaching and doing? And uh, if it didn't, then they moved on and found some other church that did. Sure. And, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't stop when you, when you walk out of, of a Protestant church, of course. It's, it's just sort of human nature. But I, I think sure. that the difference is, is that at least on a theoretical level, that's not what a Catholic should be doing. It is what a Protestant should be doing. Uh, that, this, this problem of um, chaotic interpretive authority is, is just what Protestantism is. It's, it's, it's this in principle, not just in practice. And it, I think really it was that realization, um, and I, I'd like to give a plug for another website, if, if I may. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the website called to Communion, which yeah. is primarily, I think, now run by Brian Cross, um, he, uh, he wrote an article called The Tu Quoque, which is a, a, a Latin logical fallacy. Um, and the article's not actually talking about the fallacy so much as the argument that Protestants will often give that, well, Catholics are in the same boat that we are. You know, you've done your homework, you pick the Catholic Church, I've done my homework, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist, I'm an Anglican, whatever. Um, and so, in principle, we're basically in the same boat, you're just ending up somewhere else. And um, Brian brilliantly demonstrates that that's not the case that uh, the Catholic is doing something in principle that is radically different than what the Protestant is doing. Um, and the failure to recognize that, I think, is a big part of the reason that people do not understand Protestant to Catholic uh, conversion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, hey, we're coming up on the break. Uh, when we come back, uh, maybe we can start unpeeling this uh, Protestant understanding of the Bible alone, so scriptura. We're talking with Dr. Douglas Beaumont, uh, author of Evangelical Exodus. And uh, folks, you don't want to miss it, because uh, this is important stuff if you're going to talk to non-Catholic Christians. Stay tuned. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support 
because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%! Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. Yes, we're talking about the Bible alone, uh, the Protestant understanding of Bible alone, bi biblical sufficiency and all that. We're talking with our guest, Dr. Douglas Beaumont. Uh, Dr. Beaumont, uh, uh, how did Sola Scriptura come up in Protestantism? Uh, was this... Uh, uh, was it because they rejected the historic church and that was the default, or um, how did it come about? Well, the uh, the history behind it, um, as far as I've been able to tell, is is that uh, Martin Luther in the 16th century began seeing uh, legitimate abuses um, the, in the uh, church, um, and and rightly stood up against them. Um, and when he was not really maybe taken as seriously as he thought he should be. Um, that led down the road to, to further and further criticism, and, and eventually he kind of crossed the line um, from legitimate criticism of abuses to um, more just private interpretation, calling the church out for things that uh, it did not teach, um, had never taught. And um, when he didn't kind of get the hearing that, that he seemed to think he deserved, I think the principle of sola scriptura really emerged at that point that, um, you know, he, here he had an interpretation of the Bible that he thought was legitimate. The church disagreed with his interpretation. And so in Luther's mind, he had to make a choice. Am I going to go with the church or am I going to go with the scripture? And, you know, when it's framed in that mindset, the obvious choice is scripture. <clears throat> um, yeah. You know, the church itself teaches that the Bible alone is inspired. Uh, it doesn't teach that it itself is inspired, at least, you know, not in anything like the same way. And so uh, for Luther, um, at least the way the history books tell it, it came down to, am, am I going to bend to this church that's doing all of these immoral things and teaching something that is clearly against uh, what he thought the Bible was teaching, or am I going to trust the Word of God alone? and go from there. And so that principle really uh, became one of the two major uh, kind of columns, <laughs> support columns yeah. of the Reformation. Um, the, the theology that drove it was the idea of sola fide, or, or salvation by faith alone, apart from um, sacraments, apart from the Church. And that itself really was based on the idea of sola scriptura, Scripture alone, uh, scripture alone, meaning apart from any kind of authoritative church tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Now you can see that. Um, I mean, we're not saying that uh, scripture is not authoritative, or the Word of God is not authoritative, but that it alone is not authoritative. It's that uh, qualification. But uh, the the Bible certainly is sufficient. Is it sufficient to be alone? Yeah, that word "sufficient" I think is 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 troublesome. Um, yeah, and and this again is where I, I think that the Catholic Church does a better job in thinking through some of these matters. You know, it, it's had a lot longer, <laughs> and I think it's also had a lot better thinkers uh, to go through it. And the idea of sufficiency, um, at least in the in the uh, Catholic mind, which is based on philosophy, is is that there's at least two senses in which something can be sufficient. Um, one of them is materially, and then the other is formally. Uh, material sufficiency basically says that you have everything you need 
to accomplish something or maybe like uh, talking about the ingredients, all the ingredients you need to make something. Formal sufficiency comes when you are able to take those materials and actually make them into, if you will, um, what you're trying to get. So I sometimes compare it to cooking. Um, you can have all the ingredients for pancakes, you know, flour and eggs and milk and, and all this stuff laid out in front of you. That's materially sufficient for pancakes. Um, but if you don't know how to make pancakes, if you don't have the recipe, if you don't have the plan, the form, you know, to put these materials into, well, then you're not necessarily going to get pancakes. You might get something else. You might get biscuits. Yeah. You might get waffles. You might just make a big mess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so right. when, when the Catholic refers to Scripture as, as sufficient, we're talking about material sufficiency. In other words, yes, there is a sense in which for the purposes which God had for um, giving us his word in Scripture, materially, everything's there. You know, it it has everything you need, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but formally it does not. And and this is not demeaning the Bible in any way. Um, th this is not um, some Catholic principle that allows us to make the Pope run everybody's life. <laughs> um, this is just a feature of reality. It, it just is the case that having words doesn't necessarily give you their meaning. Um, you know, you can put a Bible in front of a two-year-old, and they're not going to get anything out of it. Um, just because the materials are there, if you don't have something to form them correctly, namely interpretation, correct interpretation, then the words aren't necessarily going to do you the good that they were uh, created for. Right. Yeah, because uh, it's kind of like church shopping, you know, that you could approach the Bible with preconceived notions. Uh, but there's nothing in the structure of the Bible that would necessarily point out why you're wrong on any particular thing. You know, it's, uh, unlike an authority that could step in and say, no, that's not how historically we have understood it. Right. And, um, you know, we're, we're not saying that the Bible's wide open, you know, that, that a thinking person can't come to the Scripture and get a lot of truth mm -hmm. out of it. But, but simply we're saying that um, it's underdetermined. You know, be, because these are words and the way language works in the human condition, there just is no language that is so precise that it's not open to misunderstanding. Yes. Um, and really, if, if, if you, even if in the 16th century that wasn't necessarily very clear, um, by the end of the 16th century it was. Um, yeah. You've got to remember that when Luther came up with this principle, um, you know, there, there weren't thousands of different denominations uh, disagreeing with each other over what the Scripture meant. Yeah. Intuitively, Luther would have understood the Scripture very well in, in numerous places because he'd been taught it. He'd been formed <laughs> uh, his whole <laughs> yeah. life. So that when he read a verse, what would instantly come to mind is what the authoritative church had been teaching for 1,500 years up to that point. Um, Luther himself was shocked by the, the abuse in his mind of his principle, even in his own lifetime. Um, he was already having knocked down, drag out fights with other Reformation leaders. Um, you know, there's the famous story of him arguing with Zwingli, who was the first one to really completely remove um, what he called the ordinances from the sacraments, uh, denying Christ's body and blood in the Eucharist, and you know, Luther stabbing the the table in between them and 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 quoting scripture at him as if that would solve the problem. <laughs> yeah, right, um, right. But he, that's the thing when when you have someone that disagrees with your interpretation of scripture. Quoting scripture doesn't change their mind because it's that scripture's the very thing causing uh, the misinterpretation in the first place. Um, and you know, 500 years of Protestantism has has just only added evidence uh, that this is the case. I mean, there, there's almost no major theological or moral issue that massive numbers of Protestants don't disagree on, even though they're all looking to the same Bible. Um, yeah. So this this isn't. Uh, this isn't so much of a theological issue as it is just, just a fact of life um, that just because of the way words work, um, you know, the Bible doesn't magically become perfectly clear just because it's inspired. Yes. Yeah, right. And it's also not in the format of a catechism either. It's, you know, it's not shaped like some sort of uh, teaching instrument, didactic instrument. It's, you know, it's stories. It's uh letters to certain uh, situations, and it takes the human intellect to kind of uh, put two and two together, so to speak, to 
to unify the doctrine there. So that there's a lot of wiggle room. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the, the typical appeal that I would hear is that, well, yeah, people disagree on a lot of things, but they don't disagree on the essentials. You know, yes. the essentials of the Christian faith are really what make Christianity Christianity, and those are so clear that they can't be denied. And again, when, when you're sort of in the bubble and you're not considering a lot of your brethren, you know, it's pretty easy to, to kind of hack off a whole bunch of different groups that you disagree with and then say, oh, look, all the ones left over agree. <laughs> yeah, uh, right, right. You know, but what really gives us the right to, to say Jehovah's Witnesses aren't, don't have a place at the table? Um, what gives us the right to do that? Well, it seems obvious because they deny that Christ is God, but Lots of Christians have denied that that Christ is God. You know, look up the Arian controversy. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. where you basically had one guy, you know, this this uh, you know desert monk fighting the entire <laughs> uh, you know yeah. empire, um, trying to bring Arianism down, and, and it took generations to finally weed it out. Um, and and even today, even saying something along the lines of the essentials. Well, let's go back to sola scriptura. What? Where is the list of essentials in the Bible so that we, we don't even agree on what the essentials are? <laughs> that's right. That, yeah. That's part of the controversy itself. So it's really only by delimiting the debate to the groups that, that you think count that these kind of backup plan B, plan C things really seem to save Sola Scriptura. Right. Yeah. And, and also, it's, then therefore, it's the disastrous to Christian unity. Because uh, you could say something's essential, and uh, another person could say the opposite is essential. And there's, how do you arbitrate such a dispute, right? You can't go to Scripture, like you said. That's kind of uh, the thing that's being controverted of, you know, it's, it's being uh, discussed. Sure. And, you know, um, you know my, my mentor in the evangelical faith, Norman Geisler, I, I think he probably came the closest to coming up with with a system like that, he he tried to make the essentials uh, discoverable through salvation. In other words, anything that that meant heaven or hell, you know, that's got to be an essential. And and he went through all this stuff, and and it's been published three or four different times, where um, he would take this principle and and he would derive the essentials. Um, from the system, but what's interesting is that in, in at least uh, three different places where he published an article on this topic, uh, he came up with a different list each time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all by really? himself. But, yeah, um, and I have huh. this documented on my website. Um, and uh, so that was the, that was my first you know eye opener that right. oh my that that seems problematic that you know we we don't even need to look outside. Um, the evangelical faith, we can just look at the guy that's making this up. He, he, he doesn't agree with himself. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's great. I hear the music coming up. We're talking with Dr. Douglas Beaumont about Sola Scriptura. The Bible alone is it our sole rule of faith. Well, stay tuned. Lots of great discussion coming up next. If you're a listener to Virgin Most Powerful Radio, you already know about Hands-On Apologetics with Master Apologist Gary Machuda. And if you're a fan of Hands-On Apologetics, then we have some exciting news for you. This February, Sensei Gary will be leaving the Apologetics Dojo in Michigan to visit the Virgin Most Powerful Radio World Headquarters in Covina, California. And if you'll be in Southern California this February, we have more exciting news for you. Not only will Gary be doing his live show from our Virgin Most Powerful Radio studio, but he will be giving a live presentation on February 20th at 7 p.m. right here at the Sacred Heart Chapel. That's Gary Machuda speaking live on the topic of Breaking the Bible Barrier, Why Catholic Appeals to the Bible Fail, and How to Make Them Successful. For more information, call 877-526-2151 or visit virginmostpowerfulradio.org. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. 
We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. We're talking to Dr. Douglas Beaumont about Sola Scriptura. And Dr. Beaumont, I, man, that's you're right. There's so many problems in terms of interpretation, which leads to disunity. But... Uh, is, aren't there a few passages where uh, non-Catholics will appeal to that, that believe that it teaches sola scriptura in the New Testament? Yeah, there there are uh, one or two, uh, which is, is somewhat surprising for something that is, you know, allegedly so important. Um, yeah. You know, here, here's, a, here's a theory that divided the church worse than any heresy in, in the history of... <laughs> mankind and and you know you, you've yeah. just got to really scratch to to find any kind of biblical backing for it um the most the most famous one the one that you'll hear the most and the one that most protestants take seriously is uh in saint paul's letter to to timothy the second one um where he says all scripture is um inspired by god or breathed out by god is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Um, now, I read that verse a lot and never really considered it to be teaching, you know, that Scripture was anything other than inspired. It, sure, we all believe that. Um, it's right. profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training. Uh, that's it. I mean, that's that's yeah. all... <laughs> <laughs> That's all this verse affirms, is that Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for a bunch of stuff. Uh, there, there's no mention of sufficiency here, all sufficiency, any kind of sufficiency. Um, you know, the, there's nothing in here that says that it alone um, has these properties. I mean, you, you can't even say that um, extra-biblical materials aren't inspired um, from Second Timothy. Now, we don't believe that there are any. But right. that's a theological position. You know, the Scripture doesn't say that it alone is inspired, much less yeah. that it alone is sufficient for the faith. Um, so you don't. That, that's the that's the best that they've got. <laughs> yeah. Um, and right. It's not there. So it, I mean, sola scriptura. So it affirms in this verse. Right. It affirms the scriptura, but doesn't affirm the sola. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, what 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 it's saying about Scripture isn't enough to get to get you to sola either mm. yeah right um the only other verse that <clears throat> i've seen well there's a couple others uh, uh i know john macarthur makes a big deal out of psalm 19 um which is talking about god's law and and again never says anything about sufficiency or being alone um and it's only talking about a part of the old testament um which would be ironic because if if David here is actually saying that the Old Testament up to the point at which he's writing Psalm 19 is sufficient, well, then you've got to be able to get the entire Christian religion, you know, from the Pentateuch, essentially. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, right. Which nobody argues that. Um, and then finally, the, the, of, the, of the big three, and, and honestly, I don't even know if I can think of any others other than very, very indirect uh, type evidences is first corinthians 4 6 which talks about not going beyond what is written um and I, I have a whole entire section on this in the book and on my website but just just to summarize um first of all uh 
some of the very most important Protestants of all time did not use this verse to argue for sola scriptura, even though they were arguing for sola scriptura. Um, you're not going to, you know, John Calvin, Martin Luther, John Wesley, Matthew Henry, n- none of these guys interpreted 1 Corinthians 4 6 as saying that sola scriptura is true. Um, and they even came up with numerous interpretations themselves. So this is not a very easy verse to interpret. It sounds good if you're talking about Sola Scriptura and you just kind of throw it out there. Um, But when you actually read it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, Paul is is spending 1 Corinthians specifically talking about church unity, (laughs) ironically. Um, (laughs) And uh, by the time you get to this chapter, he's talking about being humble and how to correctly and biblically judge between ministerial leaders. None of this has anything to do with Sola Scriptura. Um, it would just be bizarre if, if just in a you know, minor phrase, in a larger sentence, in this whole letter, all of a sudden he throws Sola Scriptura out there and never talks about it again. Um, so, yeah, th- there really is no good proof text uh, for the doctrine. Yeah, yeah, which is, like you said, it's ironic if this is the doctrine uh, that is essential. You know, <laughs> you would expect something a little bit more firmer than that. Sure. Um, yeah, which brings up another thing. You know, now you do you have problems with the sola, but you have problems with the scriptura. I know this is a, an issue that's near and dear to my heart and your heart, is how do you know what the scriptura is if you're following the Bible alone? Right. Yeah, what I, what I <clears throat> like to point out to people is that, you know, one of, one of the most important extra-biblical traditions of the Church uh, is right on the first page of most people's Bibles, uh, namely the Table of Contents. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, you've got an uninspired page right there that, you know, if that page is wrong, then the whole, the other 2,000 pages might not be right either. <laughs> That's a good um, point. This is a very yeah. important page. Um, right. And so how did we get that page? How did we get our Table of Contents? And again, this is one of those things where kind of the the overall history in my mind really did not turn out to be matching the reality. Um, in my mind, the apostles wrote the Bible, got done, you know, sewed it all together, <laughs> and, and handed a completed Bible onto their predecessors, and then we've just been interpreting it ever since. Um, and as you right. know, the, the, the actual history is a lot messier. Um, it was It was hundreds of years before the church really firmly settled on what was included in the New Testament, and the entire canon of Scripture continued to be debated all the way up into the Reformation. Um, So if, if if we don't trust the church and the decision that it made in the 4th century for the Scripture, uh, then we're in a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, when you were working through this, uh, where did the problem start? Was, was it with the Old Testament canon, or was it with the New Testament canon? Uh, for me, honestly, it was the New Testament. Um, I, I was aware of the so-called Apocrypha, you know, the the, uh, the extra books that the Church put in, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. the way we thought of it. Um, but I also knew that those seven books were, were not terribly important theologically. Um, you know, my world wasn't going to get turned upside down if, if First Maccabees was actually inspired or not, you know. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, but th- just the fact that, you know, why do we all have the same New Testament? That was really odd to me, because the grounds on which Luther was attacking the church for putting uh, what we call the Deuterocanonicals, the, the, extra, the uh, extra books <laughs> that um, exceed the Protestant canon, um, you know, he was taking the church to task for that. And so that led me to go, well, hmm, who put the New Testament together in the first place? And lo and behold, you know, it's the church. Um, yeah. And once again... I had heard several theories, kind of like orthodoxy, um, as to how the books were chosen. But as I really drilled down, I came to realize, you know, none of these work. (laughs) Um, Every single one of these so-called tests uh, for whether a book made it into the Bible either included books that nobody wanted included, or it excluded books that everybody agreed belonged in there. Um, the only test that actually gets you the Bible the way it is today is the, is the church's determination. And again, because that didn't happen until, I mean, the earliest, you know, the middle of the fourth century, 
that led me to go, well, hmm, I wonder what else the church was teaching by the middle <laughs> or end of the 4th century. And, oh my gosh, there's Marian veneration, there's the Pope, uh, you know, there, <laughs> yeah, there's right. the hierarchy, there, there's all this stuff that, um, you know, the, the Protestants got rid of, you know, a thousand years later, uh, because it wasn't in the Bible. And, and you know, the, the cognitive dissonance that this produced, you know, just eventually was too much. You know, how, how can I pick and choose what to trust the church for? Um, e- even if I limit it to what the church taught up until the Bible was solidified, you still end up outside Protestantism. Yes, yeah, that's true. Because if if you can trust the church in the 4th century to give us the authentic uh, New Testament canon, then why can't it also be competent to affirm Christian doctrine in general, right? Sure, and you know we you know we trust the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was was before the canon. It existed before the canons. You know, so here we have, you know, the most universally accepted statement on Christian orthodoxy, and it's it's in existence. You know, a, a, a full generation before the Bible is even solidified. So. There's also just the practical problem of, of how in the world would Sola Scriptura even work um, up until the invention of the printing press, um, which, you know, of course, just happened to coincide with the Reformation. Um, you know, when, when, you, when you simply can't access these writings, um, everybody was dependent on the church, and it worked. You know, it worked fine. Um, yeah. Yes, the church has, has had some problems, but those problems got resolved. And, and what's interesting is that, you know, the, the legitimate issues that Luther had in his day were settled, and they were settled in the same way they've always been settled, at an ecumenical council. You know, we see this as far back as Acts 15. You know, Christians are, are disagreeing on what you need to do to be saved. They, they got the leaders together, and they had a council. Um, right. You know, they didn't have a Bible study. Um, they had a council. And, and, you know, when they believed that, they, that the Holy Spirit had spoken through them, Sure, they quoted some scripture, but it wasn't determinative. I mean, this this is not scripture that really seemed to to even say <laughs> what they were saying. You know, depending on on how you interpret it, um, and that's what the church has always done. That's where we got the Nicene Creed. That's where we got Chalcedonian Christology. That's where we got the New Testament. Um, this is just the way the church has always operated. And and eventually, I had to admit to myself, like, I don't know how to draw the line. I don't know how to legitimately say here is where that stopped being the way to do things. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you're absolutely right. It, and boy, you did an outstanding job going through this issue with us, Dr. Beaumont. And I, we only have a minute or so left. And I was going through your website. By the way, it's douglasbeaumont.com, everybody. Write that down, douglasbeaumont, one word, dot com. And going through your, your books, I didn't realize how many books you wrote. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about bumper sticker Catholicism? Yeah, um, while while I was going through this whole process, I, I became um, good friends with Devin Rose, um, who has written some excellent books, um, uh, The Protestant's Dilemma, um, If Protestantism is True, um, and uh, Na- Navigating the Tiber, I think it's called. Um, yes. I have that on ebook, so I, I can't see it from here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he and I became uh, good friends. In fact, uh, he, he became my sponsor um, when I came into the church. Wow. And uh, we had been talking about the fact that you know, th- this kind of doing bumper sticker theology could be so annoying. And then we we thought, well, hey, why don't we actually write a book called Bumper Sticker Theology and g- give Catholics some bumper stickers of their own? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's great. That's a book you can get by signing up for my website. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on Hands On Apologetics. We appreciate it. All right, Gary. Great to be on. All right. Coming up tomorrow, everybody, 10 warning signs that your loved one's being pulled out of the church. Don't want to miss it. Also, coming up next, uh, well, uh, Terry and Jesse is going to be attending a funeral. So we're going to have the best of the Terry and Jesse show. And I don't know how they could select the best of because there's so many great programs that they've done. Anyway, it's time for me to turn off the dojo lights here at the command center. Hope everybody has an incredible day. And thank you so much for listening. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. 
listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.